been missing the neon lights Trying to find all the places I go I am Ashley Hoover Baker, TasteOfReality.com's gossip guru, self-proclaimed fangirl, and pop culture enthusiast with a sweet spot for nostalgia. You're listening to On This Day Entertainment, a podcast all about the greatest reality TV and pop culture happenings from today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Welcome to the Fanny Pack. In the words of Bethany Frankel... It's time to mention it all. Without further ado, for this week in reality TV and celebrity news, we started off with one of the thirstiest celebrities out there, and that is Miss Brandy Glanville, friend of a friend of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, because like she's a friend of Kim, who's technically this season a friend of Kyle's. And that's just ridiculous. Like, why? Teddy is pretty much a friend of Kyle's, but she's a full-time cast member. We need no Teddy. And if we're going to have Kyle there, we need to throw her sister in in that role. Just saying. But Brandy, just how she's gotten in the middle of the storyline, well, by getting in the middle of Denise Richards' legs, allegedly, she has found herself in the middle of some dirt on Netflix's show, Selling Sunset. Queen Christine Quinn went on Brandy's podcast, you know, the podcast where allegedly again Denise was working and Brandy allegedly traveled to uh, go see her on set so she could record the pod and that's again when allegedly um, things went down between them and I mean that literally and figuratively wow Christine is made for reality TV. I mean, this girl is in the middle of all the drama. Her name is always in the tabloid, and she knows exactly what she is doing, as evidenced by her performance on Selling Sunset. So she went on unfiltered and said, quote, from day one, obviously the producers had certain things in mind. They wanted us to clash, obviously, and at first we didn't. We got along great. We were friends. She was at my house. We were drinking, having a good time. I was getting to know her, and the storylines came into play. We thought that we were going to be good at separating things. And then she explains that at the end of season one, how there's this fight, and (laughs) it's the iconic line that she had. You know, when Christine accused Chriselle of being fake, And then Christine said, only my tits are fake. I'm not fake. And that's like the most Christine shit ever. Well, I guess we would have to say her face is fake now, too. Like, holy Botox, Batman. I mean, Christine Quinn is like a fucking goddess. Let's be honest. This woman is tall, slender. She's got this like waist length blonde hair. I mean, this woman is just like drive off the side of the road attractive And she has done so much Botox. Her face looks so different this season that just aired. Made me kind of sad. I miss her old face, but if I sound jealous, it's because I am. And that's true. And I can still be jealous and not be a hater. It's just my opinion. That's my opinion! Christine explained that she and Chriselle had this agreement where they would call each other after filming after that whole season one fiasco just to make sure everything was cool between the two of them. They thought that they were going to be better at separating things, but sometimes it has affected their real lives, as I would think you would imagine. I know personally I'd have a hard time separating those things, but that's probably why I'm not on reality TV. Oh, plus I'm definitely not on Selling Sunset because I'm not like 5'10 and 110 pounds. So that probably played a, a small role in that. But Christine, being Christine, had to make it all about her, and I'm here for it. And she said about that season one finale, she said that the producer said, quote, give it, give it. It's the season finale. I was like, yeah, I'll give it. I don't care. We need to get picked up. And I just love that she is constantly like breaking that fourth wall saying, hey, we need to get this show picked up because she's acknowledging the fact that she's on a show and it's not just about real estate. Thanks for the honesty, girl. 
And this is my favorite because Christine had to have like really like hit into Brandy's heartstrings at this point when she said, honestly, I don't know if we would have gotten picked up if it wasn't for me acting like a drunk shit show. And Brandy has never felt more connected to anybody in her life. If you haven't caught Christine in the news talking shit about Chriselle, it's so funny because after I wrote this article about how she said that they had this agreement, but I've also written multiple articles about Christine talking shit about Chriselle and Justin Hartley, and it's messy, and she's giving us what we want. So there you go. In Tuesday's news, we learned that Andy Cohen will miss Stassi and Kristen on Vanderpump Rules. A lot of people were very upset with him saying that because after Kristen and Stassi, of course, got fired, we're probably close to like three months ago now for calling the cops on Faith because, well, she's black, so obviously that's not okay. Bravo's decided to cut terms with the two Vanderpump Rules OGs, and Andy Cohen, after that news broke, said that he supported Bravo's decision, hadn't commented on it since, and now he came out saying he's going to miss Stassi and Kristen. And I have to say, I think this is like one of the weird things, and I talk about cancel culture on this show all the time, so if you're new, welcome to the fanny pack. If you've been here for a while, you know where I stand. The thing is, just because I'm mad at Stassi and Kristen for what they did, and I definitely think they need to do better, and I think Kristen is definitely on her way. I reported a few weeks ago on this show that she had started donating a portion of her cameo videos to the NAACP, which is awesome, and I recently learned that she... I'm not sure. I think she made Black Lives Matter t-shirts under the James May company. If not, she's dedicating some money, maybe both. But she's definitely doing some work and putting her money where her mouth is because both of them gave like this really half-assed apology. Stassi and Kristen's apologies were pathetic. The only ones more pathetic were Andy Cohen and Lisa Vanderpump. Don't get me started. But Stasi and Kristen, it was obviously a publicist written apology. Since then, Stasi has only come out talking about pregnancy. The only time we see her out is regarding her pregnancy. And Kristen has been out doing stuff. So I wanted to go ahead and give Kristen Doty a shout out for that. And can I just say that I'm with Andy Cohen. I think we can both want to keep Stasi and Kristen available for what they did. They need to do the work. But that doesn't mean if Vanderpump Rules comes back and if I decide to watch again, which who knows, if Jax is back, I definitely won't watch. If they remove him, I might consider. So if that happens, I definitely miss Stassi and Kristen because they're the reason I love the show. But again, we can miss somebody and be happy for them. I'm glad they're both doing well. I mean, Stassi's like really doing well right now, which is crazy, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. But yeah, I feel Andy on that. And a lot of people said, no, you can't have it both ways. But I'm having it both ways right there with Andy Cohen. Somebody who's not having it anyway. I mean, Lisa Renna's doing Lisa Renna, but... <sighs> Girl, enough, enough, Taylor Armstrong, enough already. She said it best. Lisa Rinna is putting out these dance videos and she's been doing them for a very long time. These dance videos are typically of her in a bathing suit, well, bikini, let's be real, her underwear, whatever the case may be. She's got this super toned, super slender body that most of us are super envious of. And recently, there has been some talk on set, on camera, that we've seen about Queen Garcelle Bouvet uh, commenting on Lisa's videos and saying, well, you know, maybe I wouldn't be dancing around half naked if I had a daughter with an eating disorder. And that struck all the chords for Lisa Rinna. She was not here for that. Not only did she respond to Garcelle's opinion, she clapped back to an opinion, which honestly, I don't understand how you can't see that. Like maybe it's just because I've had so much pressure in my life to be thin and in the society that I live in on the West Coast, being thin is very important to your social status. It sounds totally vapid and it is, but it's very true. And it, it's always been a point of contention for me because I've never just been 
thin. It's just never happened. If I'm thin, I'm starving and I'm miserable from working out all the time. And that is my damn honest truth. Long story short, Lisa Rinna has been making all these clapback dance videos. And then all of a sudden, we being us, being everybody here in 2020, was gifted, whether you wanted it or not, the song Wet Ass Pussy by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. And there have been some videos that have gone back and forth between different parody accounts, Lisa Rinna, et cetera, et cetera. Lisa made this video and it's the most disturbing thing. Like, first of all, I think her dance videos are pretty okay. Usually this one just, I think the progression, like it was a progression from them being funny. I thought they were really entertaining and funny and I was here for them at first. And then they, we took a journey to them being really, really thirsty and it was it was getting uncomfortably thirsty but then it took a quick turn to desperation and being pathetic and that's where we are now this one she gets on the ground she's on all fours and she's doing this like popping of her rib cage it's like if you were doing yoga it'd be like very fast like cat cows and then she like got up and girlfriend is amazing this body is amazing I know she's super strong but she went to get up from doing one of her moves and it looked like it was really hard for her like she looked kind of old for once and it was kind of funny for me who definitely could not do this cardiovascularly not in my range but Lisa like had to use her hand on her knee to pull up her body weight and girl relatable relatable AF she proceeded in this bathing suit to kick up her leg and eventually make it back down for some more floor work in which she did that gyrating rib cage move again and then did the what I like to call the Bethany Frankel mention it all it was just so bad Lisa Rinna seriously seriously listen to people listen to us this is really bad and the weird thing is is that her daughter's going along with it like it's all good like her daughter even clapped back at Garcelle's comment very bizarre all right let's talk about something even more bizarre but I think we have some good news here on Wednesday we learned that the queen of all queens Ms. Britney Spears filed to have her creepy ass dad removed as her head conservator we have known that Jamie Spears has been a big part of the problem for a long time even before Sean Preston requested a restraining order against him Sean Preston of course her oldest son he has given off it's been bad and we've all had these feelings now it's confirmed we'll see where this goes in the free Britney movement and you know I will keep you posted as Britney is my love and I only want the best for her oh my gosh I only want the best for this family also this broke my heart you can always check for the articles I write at on this day entertainment.com I you know if you listen again if you listen to the show regularly you know I'm here for a true crime story and this one knocked my socks off it is a story of an alleged murder for hire plot there's a show on the Oprah Winfrey network I guess it was on just till a few years ago called Welcome to Sweetie Pies. It's about a small restaurant in, I forget exactly what southern city it is, but it's a mom, her two sons from what I understand, and then like another generation of young people, Ms. Robbie, who is the head of the show. So apparently... This man, her son, his name, this murderer guy is named James Timothy Norman. He was on the show, apparently had gotten a life insurance policy for his nephew, which is weird because his parents are around. So why would the uncle get a life insurance policy? Yikes. Making himself the sole beneficiary. I mean, all this was just like, where was Dateline this whole time? The murder of Andre Montgomery was four years ago, and apparently it was over a $450,000 life insurance policy, and that's the grossest shit I've ever heard in my life. So the guy from this show, James, didn't work alone. Apparently, he worked with a woman named Tarika Ellis to allegedly pull off the murder. 
there were some burner phones that they had been able to track in the days leading up to the killing that happened in St. Louis. According to the temporary phone records, Tarika and James had been in communication immediately after the phone was activated. She also, and I don't know her connection to the murdered person, the murdered man, Andre, but I guess they knew each other because she was able to call him and learn his location. So once she learned his location, she called James. And the release shows that Andre Montgomery, who was shot and killed at about 8.02. The phone location information indicated that Tarika was near the scene of the crime after the job, job, that feels so gross. Um, after the job was done, she called James and began her travel towards Memphis. At that point, she deposited $9,000 in cash into different banks accounts just days within the murder. James had pretty much immediately after gone to claim the $450,000 in life insurance that he wanted to claim for his nephew. Can you imagine how terrible that must be for the rest of the family? Obviously, Andre, he was murdered by his uncle in a plot created by his uncle. Poor grandma, Miss Robbie, and Miss Robbie's son, Andre's dad, I can't even imagine what he feels right now, but both Tarika and James have been arrested. So if there's more that comes out on this case, you know I'm on it because as sad as I am about this, I mean, it's terrible. You know, I'm always here for a good crime story. Ew, weird transition, but somebody who's also here for another great crime story. We're moving on to Thursday's news. We learn that Stassi Schroeder, of course, from Vanderpump Rules, may be getting a new show in six months. And this is exactly why I say cancel culture isn't a thing. Point being, Stassi was fired just a few months ago from Vanderpump Rules, and already there's talk about getting her back on TV. From what it looks like, it seems that it's already been in the works, but apparently she has a contract that even though she was fired, she still has to honor for about six more months. So cancel culture is a thing for the length of your contract, maybe? I don't know, but Stassi still has very loyal fans and they are eager for her to return in any capacity. I know they're still buying merch. They are, st- hey, Chris uh, Dalia. I didn't take my name off of his uh, subscribed list for merch. I just did after finding out that he grooms young girls before having sex with them. Anyway, there are people still buying merch from these people who are allegedly canceled. So are they really canceled? I could go on forever, but I have some really bad news. One of my favorite drag queens, maybe it's because she's a Louisiana gal, but Chi Chi Devane has passed away. She was diagnosed with scleroderma in 2018. This is the saddest. Chi Chi had to go to the hospital for a scleroderma related kidney failure where he contracted pneumonia, which eventually caused his death. Let's move back on over to Netflix's Selling Sunset because we learned my girl Chriselle, quote, felt stabbed in the heart when she learned that Justin Hartley was dating his former Young and the Restless co-star, Sophia Pernis. So that's not news. We know that Justin and Sophia are dating now. It's really sad because all three of them worked on Y&R together. So it must have absolutely broken Chriselle's heart. And according to the source that came out, I mean, obviously we knew she was crushed, especially when she learned who he was moving on with. I mean, hello, who wouldn't? An insider dropped off some gossip with In Touch regarding Chriselle's reaction to hearing her ex was canoodling with his former love interest from Y&R. And if you watch season three of Selling Sunset, it was obvious she was just devastated. The source continued with, quote, 
Justin twisted the knife even deeper by making their relationship Instagram official. She had her suspicions that something was going on between Justin and Sophia before they went public and is still trying to put the pieces together and figure out the truth. Just to let you know, Fartley, who, since he's a big walking fart, that Justin Hartley, we're just going to call him Fartley from now on. And he claimed the divorce is irreconcilable differences, which is so shitty. It sounds like he wanted to get his dick wet somewhere else. And shame on him for treating our girl, Chriselle, that way. She deserves so much better. Well... On Friday, we had more really upsetting drag race news. Tyra Sanchez, who won season two of RuPaul's Drag Race, who's actually been in the news a lot lately. She has uh, retired from doing drag within the last year and has come out publicly against RuPaul saying what unpleasurable work environments that she felt that they had while on set. Things like RuPaul wouldn't make eye contact with anybody um, unless it was like an Emmy award type moment. She wouldn't even acknowledge the drag testants unless cameras were rolling. It, very unflattering. Anyway, Tyra is not known for always handling herself the best, but this, I feel so bad. She was arrested for vandalism and apparently TMZ posted a picture of an apartment I think it was and it had spray painted on it don't move here ever and apparently it's where she used to live and hasn't paid rent for months which my heart breaks for because so many people aren't working right now it's not that they don't want to work they can't work some people you know performers like Tyra who's who's not even a performer anymore anymore so who knows what the insurance situation is if there's any unemployment money coming in if there's anything at all I mean these are tough times so the fact that she spray painted don't ever move here trying to get people to not move into the place where she's living it's definitely not okay but times are so tough right now I don't know what the answer is but people deserve better than what we're getting right now even in the face of this disaster we should be doing better but I'm going to move on because I don't want to get pissed off. Oh my gosh, this story brought me so much joy. Sheena Marie Shea, who I stan, feel like there's been a lot of Vanderpump Rules news today, but this is the Vanderpump Rules news we didn't know we needed. I love a celebrity on celebrity romance. As you know, this is a celebrity on celebrity on celebrity romance, a thruple, and I'm here for it. So, of course, unless you're Des unless you're Denise Richards, you know what a thruple is. But in, in case you and Denise Richards skipped the same day of school when we learned about thruples, thruple for is for three in couple. So it's not just like a three way hookup. It's for three people who are in a committed relationship with one another. Sheena allegedly was in a thruple with her then roommate who was on the hills. We know her as Stacy the bartender. She's uh, Stacy the bartender Adams. She actually has a husband and a brand new baby. But back in the day when Stacy and Sheena lived together, they were in a thruple with John Mayer. As in John Mayer who dated Cameron Diaz and... Taylor Swift, Jennifer Aniston, Jessica Simpson. Oh my gosh, if you have not read Jessica Simpson's book, Girl Names Names, and she throws all the shade at the emotionally abusive John Mayer. I mean, I died. The way he manipulated even her family, it's shocking. A uh, must read. Actually, I listened to the book. It was my first listen ever, which I highly recommend. Anyway, John Mayer, I think he might have the like greatest quote unquote list of Hollywood like he has banged like every A-list Minka Kelly I could go on I could go on and on 
but I don't want to celebrate that because if he were a woman, she would be slut shamed. So I don't want to celebrate his list, but not shame him for it either. It is what it is. And apparently John Mayer was in a throuple with Stacy the bartender and our Shishu. And it lasted for about six months. And the most Sheena thing ever happened. She got jealous because John was more into Stacy and that called off the whole thing. Stacy and Gina have eventually repaired their relationship, but we don't know about John Mayer and if he's kept in contact with either of those gals. Who knows? He's been too busy having sex with everybody else. Well, let's wrap up the week's news with the latest single released by Countess Luann de la Sebs from The Real Housewives of New York. She released a single called Viva la Diva with the iconic music producer Desmond Child. As in the man who has written, co-written, and or produced songs for Kiss, Cher, Bonnie Tyler, Aerosmith, Bon Jovi, Joan Jett, Alice Cooper, Michael Bolton, Roxette, Robbie Williams, Hanson, Ricky Martin, Cisco. He did the thong song, People, and now he has worked with Countess Luann Delisep. I am going to let you listen to this for yourself and make your own opinion. So here is Viva La straight. Diva. I told you money doesn't buy you class, but a diva has needs. See these? They didn't grow on trees. You got to make it on your own. I'm talking to you. Once upon a time, a woman walked two steps behind. Afraid to talk and speak her mind Kept it all inside But those days are over Listen, sister Once there was a book Of rules that told you how to look A dissing glance was all it took To push you to the side But those days are over Listen, mister Diva, 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 And I'm not going to comment on this song until after the Zoom session on Wednesday, August 26th at 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. She has a new skincare line called Sonage that she's plugging. She just happens to put her single out at the same time. And she has a special guest star, Carson Cressley. You too can come to this event with Luann and Carson. It's called Spilling the Tea. And all you have to do is purchase Lou's survival kit by Sonage. That's when you'll get access to the intimate Zoom event. And just so you know, 10% of the proceeds go to the Fortune Society, where we have seen Luann donating some of her time and energy. We saw the ladies who had served their time and were getting back into the world after their sentencing and they were getting their hair done and makeup and getting the interview and life ready. So I appreciate that about the Countess. When I saw her like that she was going to be doing these philanthropic things, I was worried it was going to be so cringy because she's so out of touch. But one thing I've learned from 2020 is who the hell knows what's going to happen with people. I would have never thought that Lou Ann DeLaSeps would be a voice of reason on Real Housewives of New York, but here we are. Well, that does it for this week's On This Day Entertainment news. Head on over to onthisdayentertainment.com to read the full articles for this piping hot tea and more. I'll be right back with this week's nostalgic look back in entertainment history, so stay tuned. Welcome back, Fanny Pack. 
It's always been fascinating to me to see how the world of entertainment has evolved over the years. So let's take a walk down memory lane and reminisce on some of the juiciest and most monumental on this day events from this week in pop culture history, starting off with a historic U.S. magazine cover from 1967, the first black supermodel, Naomi Sims, was on the cover of Fashion of the Times. She is widely credited as being the first African-American supermodel. Girl was stunning. And as I think about it, I've never, and this makes me so sad, I've never heard the name Naomi Sims and maybe I'm very naive because there's Naomi Smalls for instance in the drag world of course Naomi Campbell the famous supermodel and then there's Molly Sims I wonder if any of those people used Naomi as their inspiration well if you know either of any of those Naomi's I would love to talk to them and ask them some questions so hook a sister up in 1986, one of the greatest coming-of-age films ever was released, Stand By Me. People forget that it's actually based on a novel. Uh, it's actually called The Body. It came out in 1982. Stand By Me came out in 86. It was directed by Rob Reiner, and it starred Will Wheaton, River Phoenix, Corey Feldman, and Bravo lover Jerry O'Connell. I love it so much. It has more scenes than I can count that are just so relatable. A lot of people think of it as like a lot of these movies, these coming of age films are like directed towards boys and have boy casts or they have girl casts like now and then. But I really feel that Stand By Me is a movie made for everybody, even adults. I mean, adults and kids both. I think it's a fascinating story, but seeing how the kids are tied back to the writer, oh my gosh, it's so good. This is actually, oh my gosh, this movie, Kiefer Sutherland, was the biggest asshole ever. Like, I get like a gross feeling in my stomach when I see Kiefer Sutherland because I think of this movie, and that just says what a damn good performance he gave. So if you haven't seen Stand By Me in a while, that might be one to download. I think I might actually have to hit that one up. In 1986, Tina Turner's star was unveiled in Hollywood. You can still see it at 1750 North Vine. I read a really weird story about the ceremony in that several people from the the studio, her agents, blah, 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 blah. Several people spoke before Tina Turner. All of it was recorded. And then Tina spoke and there is no footage of it anywhere. So what the heck? Also in 86 was the 38th Emmy Awards and one of my favorite shows, The Golden Girls, won Outstanding Comedy. Betty White won Outstanding Leading Actress against Rue McClanahan and B. Arthur. No, Estelle Getty was not nominated. Shame on them. And it was also nominated for Outstanding Comedy Writing. So that's no surprise, but it is always nice to hear that older women, which don't always have such a huge following on TV. And the weird thing about Golden Girls is like, I love this show since I was a kid. Like when it came out, I think I watched it from like as soon as I started watching TV with either my parents or babysitters or whatever the case may be. It's just so good. And I feel so connected to them still as a middle aged. Oh, God, I can't believe I'm middle aged. I'm middle aged. And uh, yeah, it still holds up like a lot of it doesn't hold up in the sense that you can't say a lot of the jokes that they say because it's not kind and as a society we're focused on being more kind some people like to say politically correct but it's just really about treating others the way you want to be treated and there are some really not great things that they say about Asians people of minorities in general that's just what stands out on you know from the top of my head but boy as far as like character development and the jokes that these writers wrote for these women I mean just five star Ooh, a five-star album that dropped just two years later in 88 is Injustice for All by 
Metallica. I know I talk a lot about Britney and Backstreet and all the pop music that I love, but Metallica is and will always be one of my favorite bands. They are by far the best live band I've ever seen in my life. If you have not gotten a chance to see Metallica, you have to do it. They are phenomenal. Justice was the last album to feature Cliff Burton's songwriting contributions because he died in 86 in a bus accident. And it was the first to feature contributions from Jason Newstead, who was their new bassist. The album start off, starts off with Blackened. And every time I hear that song, I went to see Metallica at the Joint here in Vegas on a New Year's Eve. And the Joint is small. Well, it was. It's closed now. But it held like maybe like 1,500 people or something. So to see a band that typically performs for like 50 to 100,000 people, to see them in a place that holds less than 2,000 was amazing. They opened with Blackened and it was everything and justice for all the title track is next eye of the beholder probably one of the best songs written as far as like rock heavy rock songs one oh my god it's like a history lesson it's a history lesson about war and how it affects people in the imagery is just amazing and after years and years and years of listening to the song i finally saw the music video which is done in all black and white and it's footage from an old movie and it coincides with the story in the song and it is more than I can stomach. It's so tough to watch, but of course it's American history and we need to know these things. This album also has the shortest straw, heart the stir of sorrow. Isn't it funny how James Hetfield always does the sorrow? It's so good. I love Metallica so much. Um, they have the Frayed Ends of Sanity, an instrumental, To Live is to Die, and then, of course, Dyer's Eve. Amazing album. One of my favorites to road trip with my husband with because we need to have music that we can agree on. Shout out to the movie Pump Up the Volume, which came out 30 years ago in 1990, starring Christian Slater. I don't remember this movie too much. I was just reading about it a little bit, and I think it might be kind of important for the time to see this as so many people are moving away from working in radio and doing their own things and broadcasting themselves, <clears throat> like I'm doing right now. He had gotten kicked off of a radio station by the FCC, much like Howard Stern, and he ended up, and I, of course, I didn't see the movie recently. I was just reading about it, but apparently he started like an independent station, and uh, that's the arc of the movie. And I was just like, wow, look at all of us. All of us podcasters have essentially started our own station by the those old definitions. I am going to go ahead and celebrate the album Pearl Jam 10 next year as it was released in 91 and that'll be the 20th anniversary next year. But it is so good. Pearl Jam 10 is almost kind of sad in the sense that it's like by far their best work and it was their first album. That's never a good thing. But I think Pearl Jam had some really, really solid albums after it. And a lot of people, well, they're just terrible now, but a lot of people just don't like them. And I don't really get that. They're not as good as I thought they were at the time, but I still like some of their songs just hit me in such a, you know, nostalgic place. Well, speaking of nostalgia, oh my God, let's keep on going with our look back for the week. Bring It On celebrates its 20th year anniversary as the film was released in 2000. It is one of the best cheerleader movies ever. And in retrospect, watching it in the last like maybe five years, it's like basically a movie about cultural appropriation. And if you haven't seen it in a long time or if you haven't seen it, the basic theme of the movie is that the Kirsten Dunst character is a cheerleader at this school. There's this new girl that she befriends and they get a new cheerleading captain, Big Red Leaves. Long story short, they have a new routine which ended up, okay, oh, and if I didn't say it already, so this group is all like white girls. It's the Torrance High School Toros and they are from San Diego. Well, apparently this is where the cultural appropriation comes in because there are the East Compton Clovers who are primarily black, if not all black, and they have 
the same routine and it's because the Toros stole their routine. So we see the girls go from the white girls from the we're pretty, we're cute, we're popular to boot. Like it's so cheesy. And then the Compton Clovers were fierce. These girls were just absolutely slaying their cheers. They had great moves. They had so much attitude. So if you have not seen this classic cheerleading movie, you really should. It was actually ranked number 30 on Entertainment Weekly's list of 50 best high school movies. And even though Roger Ebert was initially unimpressed with Bring It On, he gave it two out of four stars. He later referred to it as the, quote, Citizen Kane of cheerleading movies. So there you go. A sad throwback to 2001's accident, killing the pop star Aaliyah. She died in a plane crash in the Bahamas at age 22. They had given a warning to the passengers that there was too much luggage. The passengers didn't, nobody got off. They didn't take off any of the luggage and there was an accident. So I'm not shaming anybody. Obviously, nobody did it intentionally. It was an accident. I would never shame an accident. It's just a friendly reminder, just as there are laws about wearing seatbelts, maybe we should wear seatbelts. It keeps us safe. We can think about that with masks. Not only does it keep us safe, but when other people do it, but we can help keep others safe as well. We're going to quickly talk on a couple of relationships. You know I love a celebrity on celebrity. In 2009 was the infamous split between Brandy Glanville and Eddie Cibrian. They divorced due to irreconcilable differences. And that irreconcilable difference is Sheena Shea and Leanne Rhymes and any other woman that Eddie cheated on Brandy with. And well, Brandy is still making her way into our lives. She's like a STD. She just like comes back, always comes back. Five years later, in 2014, Angelina Jolie married Brad Pitt in France, and I hated this couple because I was always team Jen. I'm not saying that Jen and Brad had to stay together, but Brad should have been a man and dumped his wife and then run off with another woman and not cheated on her, and that's not okay. Glory, one of the best Britney Spears albums ever ever was released in 2016. Glory is the ninth album from Britney Spears. Of course, it's a pop album, but it also contains R&B elements, some EDM, some hip hop. This album is so good. And again, I wish people would let me choose their singles. These were not great singles. Make Me was the song um, with G-Unit. Is that his name? G-Eazy. G G God, I sound so old right now. Oh my gosh, that was so embarrassing. It was okay. It was a good song, not a great song. Then Slumber Party came and that peaked at 86 on the top 100. Girl, not a great choice. That is where she met her super hunky boyfriend, but I digress. They had some promotional singles, Private Show, which I hate. Clumsy, which is a good song, but Do You Want to Come Over, which is one of my all-time favorite Britney Spears songs. It's funny. It sounds like I don't like too much of this album. It's just that I don't think she picked great singles. The songs that I absolutely love and never will stop listening to are, again, Do You Want to Come Over? Man on the Moon is perfection. It's like one of those perfect mid-tempo Britney songs that is just right in her wheelhouse. Just Love Me and Just Like Me. I know. Come on, girl. But both really good songs. Very different. Love Me Down is a banger. Hard to Forget You slaps. Uh, What You Need slaps too. I mean, let's do this. Britney did reissue another version, including the song Mood Ring on demand because just randomly in 2020, Glory was on the top of the Billboard charts and... Can we just say, even in these dark times of Britney, girl has influence. In 2018, Aerosmith's lead singer, Steven Tyler, sent a cease and desist letter to, not my president, Trump, 
demanding he stops using the band's songs at rallies. This time he was requesting them stop using Living on the Edge, but that only came after they used Dream On without permission during campaigning. So at this point, Steven Tyler decided a season to desist was the best option, and I'm here for it. Also in 2018, we learned that Spice Girl Mel B, aka Scary Spice, announced she was entering rehab for alcohol and sex addiction. She had a really messy divorce, and apparently she decided moving forward she would be her best with rehab for sex and alcohol addiction. And can I just say... I want to know more. Like, seriously, tell me more. Tell me more. I feel like I'm in the chorus of Greece, but I am here for it. Well, that does it for this week's nostalgic look back in entertainment history. For this week's birthdays, shout out to the 90 year old Sean Connery, who was born in, ni- I should say, Sean Connery, born in 1930. Barbara Eden, of course, from I Dream of Jeannie, ding, was born in 31, makes her 89 years old. Queen Valerie Harper, who I learned was born in Suffern, and if I'm not mistaken, Suffern is where Aiden took Carrie Bradshaw on Sex in the City to go camping, and she said she was Suffern in Suffern, and that's where my mind went, but I love Valerie Harper. Sadly, Valerie died in August of last year, and that one broke my heart. Somebody we haven't had to say goodbye to yet, thankfully, is Cindy Williams, who played Shirley on Laverne and Shirley. She's turning 73. Shelley Long, one of my queens, she's most known for being in the, on the show Cheers, but I love the movie Troop Beverly Hills more than anything. If you follow On This Day Entertainment on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, you would have seen the dream cast I made using only fictional characters of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And of course, Phyllis Neffler made that list. Shelley Long is 71. She's actually the same age as my mom, which is crazy. Tim Burton, the director of some of my favorite movies from Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands to Pee Wee's Big Adventure. He was born in Burbank and he turned 62. Right after him is 59 year old Carolyn Manzo from the Housewives of New Jersey. So happy birthday to Carolyn. David Fincher, the director and producer of Social Network, Gone Girl, turns 58. Ooh, Bay AF, Blair Underwood, who I will always think of him, is Dr. Robert Leeds, one of Miranda's boyfriends. Oh my God, he was so hot. And I felt really bad for him. He was a great boyfriend. He was the guy that Miranda ended up having to break up with because she realized she was in love with Steve. Oh gosh, I miss Sex and the City so much. So good. Jason Priestley turns 51 this year, as does Jack Black. Supermodel Claudia Schiffer turns 50. And can I just say, Claudia Schiffer, we salute you. Showing. Sadly, River Phoenix would have been 50 this year also. We mentioned Stand By Me earlier. He died tragically in 93. Happy birthday to Backstreet Boy Howie D, who is 47 this week. Dave Chappelle also turns 47. Hottie Hodderson from Big Little Lies and True Blood. Alexander Skarsgård could get it. He's 44. I always forget that Macaulay Culkin is my exact same age. He's 40. Chris Pine is also 40. Chad Michael Murray turns 39 this week, as does Rachel Bilson and Bobby Burke. Leanne Rimes turns 38. Florence Welch turns 36. This is where I start feeling very old. Blake Lively is a young 33 this week. Drag queen extraordinaire Trixie Mattel turns 31. The adorable Kiki Palmer is 27. And one of my favorite new pop singers, Dua Lipa, turns 25. So happy birthday. Thanks for tuning in to On This Day Entertainment, the podcast for all your TV and pop culture nostalgia and news from today and yesterday. If you want to stay in the know, subscribe to On This Day Entertainment wherever you get your podcasts. Remember to follow On This Day Entertainment on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. 
pack while you're there. Join the Fanny Pack Facebook group. You can always deep dive the articles I write for Taste of Reality at onthisdayentertainment.com. You can find merch there, including the new Sonia Morgan and Liam McSweeney shirts. There are logos from On This Day Entertainment, podcast art on fanny packs, tote bags, t-shirts, coffee cups. I'm doing live events on Instagram every Wednesday. I'm doing IG live takeovers. Joining me this Wednesday, August 26th, I am going to be joined by the Black Socialites. If you've been following the Real Housewives of Potomac drama lately with Candace Dillard Bassett, she totally fat shamed a blogger and said she wished that he would die. Uh, Well, he's going to be joining me to talk Potomac because why wouldn't we? And I'm just about to confirm my 90 day fiance guest. So you're going to have to hold on to that one till later. Until next time, you are too cool to be forgotten. Later, skater. Later, skater.